This recording is the first in a series of uh, recordings that cover the endocrine system. This will be an kind of introduction to it, going over kind of the basics of uh, the endocrine system and also compare it to the nervous system. Um, we'll also, I'll discuss some structural classifications of hormones and mechanisms of hormonal action as well as looking at regulation of hormonal, hormonal secretions. Now to start with, um, the, both the nervous system and endocrine systems are involved in integration and coordination. So both of them are going to be, uh, actually act as like control centers in certain reflexes where they can interpret information, integrate it, and then carry out, tell certain effectors what to do to respond to a particular change. So both of them are very important in homeostatic balance and maintaining homeostasis. Now they are similar in that they both use signaling molecules and we're gonna go over the difference between them. They both control activities such as, you know, um, body processes um, and it can include things like blood pressure and um, body temperature, metabolism, so they're going to be being both involved in control of body processes and they actually both are uh, regulated by negative feedback mechanisms. Now what I want to do first is kind of compare or look at the signaling molecules that the endocrine and the nervous system use. The, end or the nervous system use a synaptic signaling, which is um, kind of an example of paracrine regulation in which you're going to regulate things that are nearby. And so it involves that release of these neurotransmitters, which cross the synapse and bind the receptors on the target organ or the target structure. Now, the endocrine system uses endocrine signaling. And with this type of signaling, the the hormone is released into the bloodstream and it can have effects, widespread effects and, and travel to a number of different places and elicit a particular re, um, response. So they both have signaling molecules but the um, nervous system uses neurotransmitters such as say acetylcholine, um, norepinephrine, uh, GABA, so they use neurotransmitters while the endocrine system uses things referred to as hormones. Now we can kind of compare and contrast the endocrine versus the nervous system. Um, so let's do kind of the what I had mentioned before, the comparisons. So I had said they both use signaling molecules, but a difference is the nervous system uses neurotransmitters as a signaling molecule, while as the endocrine system uses what we refer to as hormones. The mechanism by which we elicit effects or the mode of transmission is different. In the nervous system, it uses the synaptic signaling, while in the endocrine system, we use endocrine signaling. Now they both are going to be, what's similar is they both control body activities, and we're going to be very general, body activities. The, and also similarity is on the target structure, you have to have a receptor for it, otherwise you wouldn't have a response. So for example, on here, this is representing say cardiac muscle. Um, we'll say perhaps this is a um, nerve fiber that releases norepinephrine and that causes that the heart to increase its rate, increase cardiac contractility. The re there's a receptor for that on the heart that binds to it and elicits the effect. Now with the hormones, they have to bind to receptors and they're going to be on their various target organs. Now the difference is the um, the endocrine system can have much more widespread 
effects. The nervous system is limited because with the nervous system you have to have this innervation by this neur the neuron and so it has to particularly innervate that structure because these neurotransmitters are not going to stay around for very long so they're going to be limited to having the effects where they are going to be uh, right next nearby. It's what they refer to as paracrine signaling. Now the, the endocrine system releases hormones into the bloodstream and so it can have effects in multitude of different tissues and organs at the same time so it has more widespread effects. Now you're not going to have an effect if there is no um, receptor for that particular hormone. Okay, so that's something key to remember. Um, the Both of them are involved in controlling, um, are very important in regulating homeostasis. The endocrine system is more long-term effects while this nervous system is more short-term effects. Now we're going to specifically um, talk about the endocrine system and the endocrine system we said I had mentioned release these substances called hormones. Well the responsiveness of a target cell to a hormone depends on three different things. One of the things it's going to depend on is the concentration of the hormone in the bloodstream. That would be one thing. It will also depend upon the number of receptors. So no receptors, no effects. More receptors, a little bit greater effect. And the third one is, is it also, the responsiveness of a target cell depends on the influences exerted by other hormones. Hmm, gotta think about that one. So we have different patterns of hormonal interaction. So hormones, they don't exist in a vacuum. It's not just one hormone and other, other ones around. You have a multitude of hormones circulating in your body at one time. And so you can have some interactions amongst the hormones. And so there's so, three things or three types of hormonal interactions. So we're gonna kind of talk about this one right here. And the they include, oops, I'll write them down first. So they could be um, antagonistic or exhibit antagonism. We're going to look at permissiveness and synergism. And we're going to look at two different types of synergism. So let's look at these. So the first one is antagonism. So antagonism is when you have hormones, two hormones that have opposite effects. So for example, here's the pancreas. The pancreas can release insulin and glucagon. Well, those two hormones are antagonistic to each other. Insulin, what it does is it stimulates glycogen synthesis. So you're taking glucose together and forming this branched molecule so we can store that glucose. So that stimulates glycogen synthesis. However, glucagon does the opposite. It stimulates glycogen breakdown. So they're referred to as being antagonistic. We can have permissiveness. So permissiveness is a term that refers to where we an action of a hormone on a target cell requires a simultaneous or recent exposure to a second hormone. So um, prior exposure or simultaneous exposure of a target cell to one hormone permits, and that's where it comes in, permits the other hormone to have an effect on it. So you can actually, can't get the full effect of a hormone without another hormone, you may not have an effect at all. So a great example you see here is say thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone, such as T3, on fat, 
will not directly will not stimulate the release of fatty acids. Epinephrine, though, stimulates the breakdown of fat, so it stimulates lipolysis. Now, if you have epinephrine and thyroid hormone, you'll have um, a very large amount of fatty acids that are being released. So in this case, the full effect of epinephrine relies on thyroid hormone. And what really, in this case, the, the reason for this is thyroid hormone stimulates the production of receptors for epinephrine on its target structures. So to get, in this case, the full effect of epinephrine on adipose tissue, you need the, the presence of thyroid hormones. Okay, so they refer to that as being a permissive effect. Another example of permissiveness would be in the uterus. Prior exposure of the uterus to estrogen induces the formation of progesterone receptors. And so when you're in that later part of the female reproductive cycle, you're going to need to have the effects of progesterone, but you need that prior exposure to estrogen, which takes place early on in the female reproductive cycle. Another example of hormonal interactions is synergism. So with synergism, things, or if I say hormones are synergistic, they work together to produce a result. And we can have two subsets of that. The first one you see here is if we say we have things, hormones that are, have additive effects. So if they have additive effects, is that the um, two hormones working together is, is greater than the effect of a hormone acting alone. So for each individual hormone that you see here, cortisol, glucagon, epinephrine, all three of those individually can increase blood glucose. You know, some more, a little bit more extent than others. You notice when you have glucagon and epinephrine together, you have even higher glucose than either of them alone. If you have all three together, you have a huge increase in blood glucose levels. So that's referred to as having an additive effect. So together, they have a greater effect than if they work alone. Another example of synergism, and you can have synergism, you can have additive as well as this thing called complementarity. Oops, sorry. Um, this one is, uh, yeah, because it's example synergism. You can have something called complementary, or terity, I should say, complementarity, where um, each hormone may stimulate a different step in a process. So example I'm providing you here is FSH, kind of initiates, um, early steps in the process of spermatogenesis. Testosterone is going to be important in maintaining spermatogenesis. So they kind of are involved in different steps in a process. So they refer to as that being complementarity. So they kind of complete each other or someone would say they combine in a way to enhance or emphasize the qualities of the other. They fill out or complete each other. So this is an example of synergism. Now what I want to do now is just talk about classes of hormones and the mechanisms of action. So we have different types of hormones and they elicit their effects on our target various ways, by various means. So first, when we look at structural classifications, is you have some hormones that are, um, say, amino acid derivatives. Um, thyroid hormone is an example. Um, norepinephrine is an example. Um, you have some that are uh, peptide hormones, which means just a few amino acids that you see with oxytocin. Um, you have ones that are, have a few more um, uh, amino acids. They call them polypeptides. You have ones that are a large number of amino acids together. You have proteins like human growth hormone. It's a large number of amino acids together and it's folded up into a proper 3D conformation. You also have ones that are derived from lipids and cholesterol. Um, so like testosterone, this has is a steroid hormone. 
It's derived from cholesterol. Now, I don't, you don't necessarily have to memorize the, the specific classification of every hormone. If it's important for you to know, I will actually say it to you. Um, so don't worry about, saying, I gotta sit there and memorize which are peptide hormones, which are derivatives of amino acids. Don't do that unless I specifically tell you. Okay, so we'll, do, we'll talk about that later. Now there, on this picture, you'll see there's a large number of hormones and we're gonna discuss the majority of them. Um, some of them though, like we'll talk more about the hormones involved in digestive tract when we do digestive system. Um, but we'll actually talk about the majority of these that you see here. Um, these ones we'll talk about more when we do the reproductive system. So you have some um, organs that their primary function is endocrine. Things like the, the pituitary, um, anterior, posterior pituitary, the adrenal cortex, thyroid gland, parathyroid glands. That's their primary endocrine function. And we'll be doing those organs first. And then we'll look at organs that have a secondary endocrine function. So like the heart and the thymus and adipose tissue and kidney. The endocrine function is not the huge thing that it does, but it does produce hormones. So we'll do those at the very end. What I wanna do first is look at mechanisms of action. How do those hormones elicit an effect on a target. So I had mentioned previously, those hormones must bind to receptors. So there are hormones that refer to as lipid soluble hormones, or I can refer to them as hydrophobic or nonpolar. Those would be things like your steroid hormones. Um, ones that are derived from cholesterol or lipids, they can easily cross the cell membrane. And where so their receptors are going to be found inside the cell, so we're going to refer to them as intracellular receptors. They can be in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. Even if it was in the cytoplasm, once it binds to it, typically it will still go to the, to the, the nucleus and what they do is they affect gene transcription. So their effects won't be like immediate because it takes a little bit time to turn on the production of messenger RNA, which is needed to make proteins, um, but their effects tend to be longer lasting. So examples of hormones that will use this mechanism of action would be any of the steroid hormones, testosterone, beta estradiol, progesterone, um, aldosterone, cortisol, we'll be talking about those. You don't have to try to memorize all those at this second. Um, uh, even thyroid hormones, T3, T4, they're also lipid soluble. Now the um, hormones that are hydrophilic, they like water. So if hydrophobic means you fear water, hydrophilic water or hydrophilic hormones cannot cross the cell membrane. So they have to somehow tell that cell what to do. So how does it get that message into the cell? Well, it binds to a plasma membrane receptor, or we can call it like here, a cell surface receptor. It will use second messenger systems, utilizing things like say, um, adenylate cyclase or guanylate cyclase, phospholipase C which it will activate these membrane associated enzymes that lead to production of certain second messengers which then will elicit a cellular response. It may phosphorylate proteins which end up activating certain enzymes or inhibiting certain enzymes. It can affect the phosphorylation state of ion channels which could affect um, the membrane potential. So these will have effects that um, will kind of just like Turn, I would say like it's like turn on or turn off certain events within the cell. So these are, but these effects are a little bit quicker to act, but they're shorter acting compared to if you have a hormone that's a hydrophobic hormone. Now the last thing I want to talk about is the control of hormonal secretions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop now because I try to limit the length of my uh, recordings as much as I can. So I'll do this separately in its own recording.